A couple of days ago, I received this in the post. Inside is the orchestral score of Frank Zappa's Bobbin Dacron and Sad Jane. It was gifted to me by a very nice man from Switzerland called Stefan Signer, who is a, a musician and composer. I would like to express thanks for sending this to me. Um, let's have a look. So this is it. This is the orchestral score of Bobbin Dacron and Sad Jane. It really is a beautiful score. The cover is made of this dense black plastic with this rather nice looking gold colored inscription of the title on the front. If we open up. On the first page, we have the a list of all the instruments of the orchestra and obviously the first page of the music. It's really a pleasure to follow the score because the spacings and margins are so well organized and this is really important for particularly for Frank Zappa's music because at times it's very dense and as you can see it's just so well laid out absolutely beautiful much better than some of the other versions of the score I've seen, uh, which are usually photocopies, sometimes just photographs of the actual uh, score, of each page of the score, so it's not always so clear. There's some really <laughs> interesting notations in here. One I wanted to focus on in particular, two bars here, one's 1116 and one's 1516, and it's quite an unusual way to write uh, this type of rhythm. Usually Zappa would write 11 in a time of Four. So you'd have a bar of 4-4 four, four, and then there would be 11 semiquavers written over the four beats. But here he's actually written the time signature in for them, so 11-16 and 15-16. My suspicion is that the reason he's done this is because he's got many string players performing this complicated rhythm, the 11s and then the 15s. And I would assume that it's easier for an ensemble of players to read 11-16 followed by 15-16 rather than 11 played over the time of 4 and then 15 played over the time of 4. Um, so that's an interesting uh, way of navigating the issues that Zappa would have experienced trying to get uh, many players performing complicated rhythms. <laughs> Just uh, thank you very much, Stefan. That's a, that's a wonderful um, thing to receive, and I really appreciate it. Um, so if you had bought this score, I'm assuming that it was bought many years ago while um, Bafco Swill was still in operation, the Bob and Dacron Sad Jane full orchestral score would have cost you $138, which I calculated earlier on would, would be about $300 today. So I want to talk about some of the musical problems of Bob in Dacron. Um, it's a really interesting piece, but there are certain things that seem to be uh, imbalanced for me. This is my this is my own personal opinion. Yeah, it should not interfere with your pleasure or your feelings or thoughts about the music whatsoever. It's purely my thoughts and reflections. So Zappa describes the piece as being made of uh, seven voices alternating with the various sections of the orchestra in a contrapuntal setting that purposely crosses all the voices in a way that generates seven independent ugly melody lines which, when heard simultaneously, blend together into a moving pattern of relatively disquieting harmonic aggregates. Zappa started writing this piece in 1971 and it was completed in 1979. So uh, there's quite a protracted period of time there of uh, composition. It really is a piece caught in transition and is a reflection of each new developing technique he employed within the composition. And this is possibly one of the reasons why I perceive it as being a little bit um, imbalanced in places. For example, the first couple of bars of the piece Now these successions of chords continue on the next few pages and I mean 
It's difficult to follow um, and it's difficult to sort of grab hold of anything really. The way it sounds to me sometimes is it's, it's as if it's, um, uh, it's, an, it's kind of an experimentation. Certain parts sound like that, like he's experimenting with these chords just to see how they might sound. And some parts of the score, you might not have a full grasp of what it sounds like until it's actually realized by, you know, real instruments the physical realization of what you've written and and in those cases you can go oh all right i wasn't expecting it to sound quite like that or um yes that's what i was expecting or that's what i was expecting and i i don't know if i like it so much so you would modify it and you would uh, it would help to inform the next composition <laughs> This is a call and response between different sections of the orchestra. Uh, so before that you have the, uh, the brass making a statement. This is followed by a response from the string section and then there's a statement in the woodwinds. And it, it happens quite rapidly, but it, I don't think it works. It doesn't quite work. And this is very possible. It's got nothing to do with the composition itself, but the fact that it's a very difficult thing to manipulate. Music theorist Jonathan Bernard discusses challenges listening to Zappa's orchestral music. Bernard perceives the problems to be in the structure of certain pieces, the episodic events considered not dissimilar to each other, homogenous textures with little repose and free succession of unrelated themes. Bernard suggests that there are pieces which require narrative in order for the listener to have a bearing on the auditory experience, of which he further reiterates the view in relation to Moen Herb's vacation by stating that the absence of any clues in how to organize the listening experience is quite bewildering. Now, I agree with it to some extent, but I don't think the themes are unrelated. I think Zappa was very, very meticulous about ensuring that there was continuity in the way he can compose his pieces of music. But notwithstanding, it's still a difficult listen. And what I'm saying in relation to Bob and Dacron, that some of them might be orche um, orchestration issues, um, perhaps uh, under-rehearsed um, uh, orchestra, or just merely a case of experimentation, you know? This piece is gonna have continuity, but I just wanna hear what these chords sound like. I'm just gonna, you know, write this one off as an experimentation to learn from, to develop further. Um, I mean, obviously this is all speculation, but in terms of perceiving the piece, it, it is problematic for, for, for some of the reasons already mentioned. Now, saying that, there are some really beautiful moments in this piece, and I want to point out a couple of them. And there's a little section here, which is very, very sparse, and it's very quiet, but quite haunting. And it has a sort of eerie, uh, feel to it. You, know, you have to use these words to describe music. Sometimes it's ridiculous. But uh, so in this section here in bar 108, this little um, uh, penultimate section is introduced just before the end of the first movement. And you have the strings playing these notes that are quite spread out intervallically. So it gives a very sort of open sound. And followed by this haunting melody that takes place between the French horns and the contrabass. And it's just that exchange that gives it that unique character. Another highlight for me is the uh, first movement of Sad Jane. Um, just the opening chord, it's absolutely beautiful. This is Sostinato in the harp, it's quite melancholic while the strings sustain this lush chord. I really like these little perturbations in the second bar here as well. It's a very moving moment of the piece. And then we get to the end of bar four, there's this very light and delicate melody in the winds and the tuned percussion. Really lovely. And that continues. Actually, the first minute in, 
minute or so of the first movement is, is, is really beautiful. In particular, the harmonic movement at bar 21 is just really special. And so this transition that happens just after bar 20, when we get to bar 21, the way the harmony moves here and the actual orchestration at this point. Another section of intrigue for me is uh, what Jane's body really looks like. This little section here in the strings, the rhythm is asynchronous in all parts and uh, the sort of overlap. It's, it reminds me a lot of Webern at this particular uh, part of the piece. There are some absolutely gorgeous moments in this piece, um, but it's also kind of indicative of Zappa's character, musical character, you know, never quite giving the listener what they want. Another characteristic of Bobbin Dacron and Sad Jane is the use of chord Bible harmony. Um, there are a lot of uh, minor Lydian chords in this piece, and if you're interested in finding out more about that and the, the, the analysis of the piece, then um, you can find a chapter on Bobbin Dacron in my PhD, which is available online. I hope you enjoyed this video and it was somewhat informative. Um, if you have any thoughts or you'd like to share your own listening experience uh, in relation to Bobbin Dacron, then do leave your thoughts in the comments. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.